Howdy, and welcome to another episode of Wise About Texas, the Texas History Podcast. I'm your host, Ken Wise, and thank you very much for tuning in today for a little Texas history. Uh, we've had a very eventful early winter here in Texas. We've had some uh, things that have messed with the Wise About Texas production schedule and continue to mess with it. We've had, uh, it was a general election. We've uh, That makes the court very busy. We've had uh, Thanksgiving in the middle of the uh, World War I episodes, and then unfortunately we lost our 40, 41st president, George Herbert Walker Bush, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I released a tribute episode to him last week and just thought it would be appropriate to let that sit out there for a week. I hope you had a chance to listen to it. Uh, president Bush was a great Houstonian and, and a great Texan, and that's what I talk about in that episode, even though he wasn't born here. But now we're back on track, and... Um, I've got some good ideas for the next few episodes. I'm going to release uh, one quickly next week before Christmas and uh, related to Christmas, and that's all I'll say about it. Um, But today we're going to continue with our look at Texas and the Great War, and this started back near Armistice Day uh, in November, and that was part one, and we talked about the border troubles in Texas and how that tied the United States into entering World War I. Well, part two, we're going to talk about another role that Texas played in World War I, and that is the training of the troops. So let's go back to the early 20th century in San Antonio and get wise about Texas. We've discussed in prior episodes the importance of San Antonio as a military installation. You'll recall from earlier episodes how we've talked about the Spanish attempts to colonize Texas included not only building missions, but every time they'd build a mission, they'd build a fort uh, to protect the mission and and, uh, the mission activities. So San Antonio, of course, being the home of so many missions and the largest city in Texas for so many years, Um, going back to the 1700s, that uh, San Antonio would also be a center of military activity from the earliest days, and it was. The Presidio de Bejar was established in 1718, and since that time, San Antonio has played an important role, an important military role, uh, not only for the Republic of Texas, uh, but also for the United States. Now, right after the Civil War, Uh, Between 1865 and about the turn of the century, uh, the U.S. Army had been cut down in numbers to barely 25,000 troops. And the problem that we had was the Western expansion and the Indian Wars that we encountered required more military activity. So uh, there was a logistical and structural problem for these troops. So General William Sherman um, decided that he would consolidate the Army into two large garrisons, and he picked San Antonio for one of those garrisons. A post was established called Post San Antonio, and it would later uh, come to be called Fort Sam Houston. It was established by Sherman to be one of the large garrisons in the United States. But then they had another problem. San Antonio was growing during this time and was a, a commercial center, so it was starting to grow around the fort. Well, the problem you have there is what do you do when you're training troops? Well, you fire guns, a lot of them. And so they ran out of room for target practice. Now, there were plenty of patriotic citizens around San Antonio that invited the army to use their land for target practice. And uh, now modern San Antonio, uh, it's going to be hard to imagine how much smaller it was at that time, given the growth that San Antonio has enjoyed Uh, in recent years, but to go out way out into the country uh, to train with their weapons, the army went to uh, a faraway town called Leon Springs, which is now just a a suburb and might actually be in the city limits of San Antonio for all I know, the way the city grows. But uh, so they went out there and, and small arms training took place at Leon Springs. The artillery, however, had to travel out to Kerrville in the hill country to have enough room to for artillery practice. Well, there was another problem. 
the weapons technology was advancing rapidly. You know, one of the underrated uh, facts about the Civil War is how the northern weapons technology advanced so much more quickly than the southern weapons technology. Well, those advances continued after the Civil War. And so it got to the point where even these uh, far-flung practice areas were not enough. Um, when they started post-San Antonio, you would for small arms training, you'd need about 1,200 yards uh, for a for the range and you'd need about a 60 foot berm behind the range uh, so that the bullets wouldn't travel for artillery you needed about three miles of space but by the early 1900s you needed 5500 yards for the small arms training uh, because now you had machine guns you had better rifles etc um, and so they needed even more land the Army started looking around for land to acquire, and they found some ranches near where they were training in Leon Springs that would do the job. There were two ranchers in Leon Springs that were approached. One was named Shass, um, and you'll remember from the Three Emmas episode that there, were, there was more German spoken in San Antonio during this time than any other language. So the German community was thriving, and Mr. Shass was a pharmacist, he started one of the first drugstores in San Antonio, and he started that about 1874 and prospered, and he owned a ranch in Leon Springs. Um, another rancher out there was named Daniel Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer was from Bavaria, and he had come to the United States in 1854, and Oppenheimer owned ranches all over Texas, thousands of acres, and one of them was in Leon Springs. And so these two parcels, they were next door to each other, and the Army thought, well, this will be perfect. This is kind of where we're training anyway, and uh, we're going to buy them. So they did. They put them together, bought them. They paid $6.48 per acre, if you can imagine, $6.48 per acre for these ranches. They put them together and designated it the Leon Springs Military Reservation. The first training exercises were held there in 1908, and the first artillery exercises took place in 1909. Now here's something else very interesting that happened around this time dealing with San Antonio and the military. In 1911, there was a young lieutenant named Benjamin Foulois or Foulois. I'm going to say Foulois because that's how it's spelled and I'm from Texas, not France, so we're going to pronounce it that way. Uh, lieutenant Foulois was sent with uh, the newest contraption that the Army had, an aeroplane. And he was told the following, quote, take plenty of spare parts and teach yourself to fly, close quote. So he did, and he took it down to San Antonio, to Fort Sam Houston. Well, in March 1911, Lieutenant Foulois and another man named Parmalee took off from Fort Sam Houston with a message and landed on the Leon Springs Military Reservation to deliver the message. I believe that to be, and I'm going to claim it, as the first U.S. military aviation mission in history. Now, that may be a bit of an overstatement, but I'm not going to double-check uh, because I don't want to know if it's wrong. If it's wrong, somebody send me a message. But uh, it was certainly the first Army aviation activity in Texas, and that was the first airplane uh, in the U.S. military. Well, you'll recall from Part 1 of Texas and the Great War that the trouble on the Mexican border was uh, causing everyone a lot of headache, and it was starting to become a federal issue. So the War Department wanted to practice mobilizing and readying the troops just in case they had to go into action. So around this 1911 time frame, there were 12,000 troops that were practicing these mobilizations at Leon Springs. Well, we talked about Pancho Villa attacking Columbus, New Mexico in 1916 and killing some of the citizens. That certainly got President Wilson's attention. Um, Villa conducted more raids into Texas in May 1916. Uh, he killed some 14th Cavalry troops that were down there providing protection. And... Uh, at that point, President Wilson mobilized the National Guards of Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona and federalized those troops. Well, they had to be trained, so they brought those troops to Leon Springs to be trained. 
Now, the commander at Fort Sam Houston was a major general named Frederick Funston. Uh, he was commander of the U.S. Army's Southern Department. That's how the Army was organized at the time into departments. And the Southern Department's headquarters was Fort Sam Houston, being that large garrison that I mentioned um, he was the one that was going to lead the American Expeditionary Force should we get involved in World War I. Now, this is approaching 1917, and so the war in Europe is raging, and U.S. involvement is becoming an issue. And go back and listen to Part 1, and we'll talk. you'll learn more about that. Uh, General Funston was to be the leader, but he had a sudden heart attack in early 1917 and passed away. So they, this was February 1917, and the Leon Springs Military Reservation was renamed in his honor as Camp Funston. Well, you had the plan of San Diego discovered, the Zimmerman telegram, etc., and the United States declares war on Germany April 6th, 1917. And Fort Sam Houston, of course, uh, was designated as a major training site. And during this time period, as the the Army, the U.S. Army has gone through many organizational changes as the United States has evolved, Uh, there isn't enough time in a year to talk about the organization of the United States military. But typically what would happen is divisions would be formed and they would be sort of localized. So you would have Texas divisions and, you know, regional divisions, and the troops would tend to come from a certain area of the country. And so the Army formed a new division at this point called the 90th Division, and it was going to be uh, from troops from Texas and Oklahoma. So they were going to train in the San Antonio area, as I mentioned, and the first training that was going to occur were the officers for this new division, the men selected to be officers, and that training occurred at the newly named Camp Funston. The officers arrived uh, it was called, and it's called throughout history, First Officers Training. And they went to Camp Funston to uh, learn to be officers and command all the troops that would soon arrive to train for the Great War. Well, the population of San Antonio predictably uh, exploded with these new troops as they arrived. And guess what? You guessed it. Camp Funston became too small. So the Army again had to expand. And it leased about 15,000 acres south of Camp Funston. And they named this area, this camp, after Major General John Lapham Bullis, B-U-L-L-I-S, and called it Camp Bullis. Major General Bullis had an important role in some events in Texas history himself. He was a general, a United States general in the Civil War. He was from New York. But he went on to command the famous Black Seminole Scouts, and that's going to be another episode of Wise About Texas. Uh, The Black Seminole Scouts were a troop that fought the Indians uh, and were famously known as the Buffalo Soldiers. So that's John Lapham Bullis. The new 90th Division would do its training at Camp Bullis, and uh, the old Camp Funston became... Camp Stanley. Now, why did they rename it? Well, uh, General Funston was from Kansas, and uh, the Army had just built a new installation in Kansas, and they chose to name it after General Funston since that was was his home state. So we changed the name of Camp Funston uh, to honor General David Stanley. Stanley won the Medal of Honor in the Civil War, and he took over command of the Department in Texas, uh, the Department of Texas, in 1884 after uh, General Randall McKenzie, who, of course, uh, was the successful commander of the Red River War against the Comanches, uh, another upcoming Wise About Texas episode. Uh, So Stanley had ties to Texas also. So now we have Camp Stanley and we have Camp Bullis. And finally, the Army seems to have enough room to train everyone on both small arms and artillery. Uh, From 1917, as we entered the war, to 1919, After war's end, there were 31 different Army units that were either organized, trained, or returning from war demobilized uh, at the camps that comprised the old Leon Springs military reservation. These military installations and the town of San Antonio played a huge role in preparing a large number of United States troops for their role 
in World War I, their successful role. The name Camp Bullis is familiar to you because it's still used, and the modern Camp Bullis encompasses the entirety of the old Leon Springs Military Reservation. Camp Bullis today offers base operation support and training support to what is called Joint Base San Antonio, all of the military assets in San Antonio comprising Joint Base San Antonio, and in true Texas fashion, Joint Base San Antonio services more Department of Defense students than any other installation in training. It has more active runways than any other military installation, and it has the largest hospital run by the Department of Defense. Countless troops have come through San Antonio, Texas, on their way to fight in Europe, the Pacific, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, and elsewhere. And it all started over a hundred years ago on two ranches outside the city of San Antonio. Well, now we come to the part of the show I call getting there where I tell you how you can go see some of the places mentioned in the episode. This one's easy. Head over to San Antonio. There is a museum at Fort Sam Houston. Uh, it's a great museum. There's, uh, you're not going to be able to get on to Camp Bullis unless you have a military contact, so I wouldn't try, but I would encourage you to go up to Leon Springs. Uh, the very first Rudy's Barbecue I ever ate at is up there, and um, boy, that area has changed a lot. So I encourage you, when you're over in San Antonio, to remember our brave men and women fighting around the world, honor their service, thank them for their service, and enjoy your time in San Antonio. Well, that wraps it up for another episode of Wise About Texas. Thank you very much for listening today. Don't forget to like and share the Wise About Texas Facebook page. We're on Twitter and Instagram at Wise About Texas. And if you'd like to support the preservation and promotion of Texas history, head over to patreon.com slash wiseabouttexas. Thanks again for listening today. Go out and do something for the state of Texas. And until next time, God bless Texas, and we'll see you down the road.